So today we're looking at, and a bit of an Australian theme, is the Leopard AS1, or commonly known as the Leopard 1A3. So Australia got these in about 1976, had them in service for about 30 years. I did about 12 years on this vehicle, so it's uh, pretty much one of my favourites. We did a few changes along the way. We went from spring bump stops to hydraulic, tropical radiators, uh, obviously operating in hotter temperatures, we need better water flow. We had more mobility and firepower rather than protection. So it's really only classed as a medium battle tank because the armour was a little bit thinner, but it was fast and it had a good gun for its time. Mobility on the Leopard is excellent. It's a four speed transmission. Each gear is uh, governed. Uh, first gear goes to 13 kilometres, second gear 24, third gear 36, and in fourth we can get up to our 62 kilometres an hour. So this is the MB838, 10 cylinder twin mechanical supercharged engine. It is a multi-fuel engine. Puts out about 830 horsepower at 2200 RPMs. This engine pack can be taken out in about 30 minutes. So it's a very easy engine to take in and out. Um, and very reliable. At full speed, it will cross a three metre trench. It can climb uh, about a metre step. We can forward with this vehicle. So we can actually go up to four metres in depth underwater. In order to do that, on the engine bay and around the side of the hull, we have about 13 valves that close and two valves known as clack bang valves, which are on the inside of the turret into the firewall and we put a tower on the crew commander's position and from there that's where all the air is drawn in to run our engine. The commander's hatch has a very unique safety mechanism. If we're going through water, there's a micro switch. It prevents us from closing the commander's hatch because we need to have air coming through so it actually switches off the engine. Running gear, fully tracked, torsion bar suspension. With this, it allows us to go cross country a lot quicker. We have shock absorbers on the first three road wheels with bump stops and a couple of shock absorbers at the back. As we come up, the driver sits in this position here. It's an automatic, so he has an accelerator and the brake. Now the brake pedal is big enough to put both uh, feet on at one time. Now at full speed, if you apply the brake uh, hard, this will stop in its own vehicle length. So the brakes are very big on, on this vehicle and they can stop you quite quickly. The A3 went into the welded turret. Prior to that, we had a cast turret, which we have on our 1A5. The outer plate is about 30 millimetres and we have a 40 millimetre gap said to be filled with polyurethane. And on the inside, we have a 35 millimetre plate now this equates at a 65 degree angle to about 248 millimetres of protection. So not too bad in that respect. If we go to the side, uh, we've got a 12 millimetre outer plate, a 58 millimetre gap in between, and then a 35 millimetre plate on the inside. This is angled back at about 24 degrees, so this gives us around about 114.9 millimetres of protection. So this is more to go against the heat round. Earlier turrets, weren't really protected that well, but uh, as we've seen, especially with Canadian Leopards, their Maxis, they have that extra armour plating all around their cast turrets. On the mantlet, we generally have a mixture of about 30 millimetres and changing around to about 20 millimetres. But when we go back behind the mantlet, there is extra protection there. Some areas have got 60 millimetres, some areas have got 50 millimetres of protection. The front glasses plate, 70 mil thick angled back at about 60 degrees. So this gives us a line of sight of about 140 mil. So as I said, not a very well armored tank, but it was fast. So in that respect, you want to use it for a more defensive role. So you can sit in a position, use the gun to its good effect at longer ranges, and then when need to move very quickly from one defensive position to another. So in that respect, it was a, a very well thought out tank. These things are grousers, essentially used for snow and ice. We can take these pads out, even if they get worn out, we can take them out. So essentially we'd have a pin that would come through here and it pushes on a plate. We get a bar in here and we just lever the pad out. So about one in eight alternating uh, left and right, we'd put a grouser in and this gives us extra traction if we're going through snow and ice. This is the British L7. So this come about uh, around about 1959 to combat that T-54, T-55 uh, era of tanks. So it's a rifle gun, 28 lands and grooves, 56 calibers long, I believe. It's got a twist, so it's said to have one twist in 20 calibers. Just from memory, I think it had about four twists along the way. We can fire a number of different types of ammunition. Obviously our main one, armor piercing discarding sabo, comes out at about 1478 meters per second. Uh, we also have a DST, so it's our 
essentially our practice round, about 15, 39 metres a second. We can fire a hash round, high explosive squash head, comes out at about 732. With hash, we can use this gun, if we're firing direct, we can go up to 4,000 metres. If we're firing indirect, so essentially we can still see the target, but it's above the ballistic input of 4,000 metres, we can shoot out to about eight kilometres with uh, a hash round. Early on, could fire a heat round. The only problem with the heat round is because it imparted spin with the rifling, when it would hit the target, it'd try and spin off. The Russians actually fixed that with their heat round on the T-72, where they put a rotating ring on it. We also had uh, a purse, uh, comes at about 826 metres per second. This fires about 4,400 flashettes, and that stuff will go through body armour. Mid 90s, we started introducing canister. So it's essentially a big shotgun shell. The only problem with canister, it's very short range. We generally fire it off the Hesh scale, uh, but it was good up to about 300 metres. Good for clearing infantry and barbed wire. The only problem with that is it could place uh, additional wear on your rifling. Up here, so this is the multi-barreled smoke grenade discharger system. So there's four on either side. They're all on different angles slightly. So what we generally do is we'd, uh, if we wanted to fire the right bank, uh, which the commander does electronically from his position. We traverse off to left at 11 o'clock, fire that bank, fire the left side, traverse off the right at 1 o'clock and fire that bank. Fires a uh, DM-15 smoke grenade, goes out about 60 metres in front of the vehicle. Later on we swap the DM-15 for a DM-45. Up the top here we have the tank fire control system made by Sabka. This is a laser range finder within that site, so it'll take any input up to 4,000 metres. We could laze out to 9,995 metres, but then if you want to shoot over that, that's where the crew commander earns his dollars, goes to his uh, range tables. So for whatever reason, we can't use our main site. We'll go to the secondary site, can wind on the range for this, so we can fire all natures of ammunition from that secondary site. We have our searchlight. So this is a white light infrared searchlight. When you go on the white light, it's said to be about 30 million candela power. So we can shoot out to about 1,500 metres using that white light searchlight. The only problem is if you're using white light, people can see you. So we do have that infrared system. Commander can look through his infrared site and see the infrared beam and still be able to shoot generally out to about that 1,000, 1,500 metre mark. I'm in the commander's position. So this is where I uh, spent a couple of years as what we call the Bravo crew commander. So in my position here, I've got the uh, commander's control. So I can actually override the gunner or I can point the turret in a position where I want him to look or identify a target. My main sight that I have here is the uh, TRP-2A. So it's a panoramic sight, so I can look 360 degrees all the way around. On the right hand side, I've got a detent switch, so I can unlock it and I can use my Travis hand wheel to traverse the sight all the way around. I've got a times four to times 20 magnification on this sight. Now this also has a stadiometric range finder. So the two knobs that we have here, uh, measurements in uh, meters. So essentially if I know the width and height of a vehicle, I can put that into its height and its width. And within the site itself, there's a perforated box. Once I put that box around the target, I can then read off the range to that target and then I can either shoot off my sight or give a uh, range uh, to the gunner to shoot at. Now it also has what I would call a very basic hunter killer roll. So essentially, as I said, I can uh, turn it 360 degrees. If I unlock my, when I unlock my detent switch, I can traverse around, say, to three o'clock. If I identify a target, I can then lock my detent switch in. And then once the gunner traverses right, once my sight and the gunner sight are locked in, the sight will actually lock in. So now what the gunner's looking at is what I'm looking at. I am in the loader's position. How much room is in here? This is a massive amount of room. Consider I'm only five foot four, so a lot of room for me. And this was a great position once I finished gunning, I went to the loader's position. So the loader will essentially operate the radios that are right behind him. He loads everything manually. We have our make break button here. So essentially you want to sort of make sure that the circuit's broken because the gun fires electrically. You could reach through, open up the breech, load the round, and then the breech would close behind. Along this side here, we have what's known as our 13 round ready rack, uh, APDS along the side here, and then down the, the side is a 39 round ready rack. 
We also hold four underneath the gun, APDS, and three APDS standing up. So we have a total of 59 main armor rounds. On this side here, we have our thousand round for 7.62. So this feeds into the MG3 machine gun, which is coaxially mounted. When we're firing, we have a scavenge system. If we're firing the gun, we can uh, take out all those fumes from inside the turret. And when we're firing the machine gun, we just simply change the handle around, which is located on the right hand side of the machine gun mount. And again, we can scavenge all those uh, fumes out. The loader's control box, the master switch provides power to the turret, so that's gotta be on. Uh, and he also makes sure his uh, hydraulics are on. He can actually switch the hydraulic switches off if he needs to do something within the Travis area, just so that the gunner doesn't accidentally Travis on him. So a couple of good safety features as well with inside the turret. Pistol port, we can load rounds in and out. And from, you can see how thick uh, the turret armor is. Along the back here, apart from the radios, carry spare barrels for the MG3. So there's three per gun. We had uh, one inside, one out. Carry grenades, a total of uh, six, so three either side. This handle here, as I said, the tank can forward. We generally pump up the fording hydraulics. So this has also a turret ring seal. We go up to about two, two bar of pressure and uh, we can go into water and keep essentially all the water out. Where you're sitting, where your feet are, is a ballistic computer. So in order to bring in a lot of information into that ballistic computer that compensates the site, we have a number of sensors within the tank uh, that measure a number of different variables. Inside, we have uh, temperature grain, which will measure the temperature of the rounds themselves and how long they've been uh, stored within the tank. Temperature pressure, so we're also measuring pressure both inside and temperature ambient outside. The difference between firing a round in either extreme cold or extreme heat can make the rounds do different things for the internal ballistics when it's firing. We also measure our EFC, our equivalent full charge. The barrel has a lifespan of about 215 EFCs. So an APDS round is one EFC. Uh, if we're firing uh, HESH, it's uh, you know about 0 0.02, I think, of an EFC. So it doesn't place a lot of wear on the barrel because it flies a lot slower. Uh, so all our sensors, essentially our uh, non-standard sensors are up here and that'll give you a good indication of uh, what's available. We also have a crosswind sensor which is on top of the roof. It uh, looks like a little bird cage stuff. So it's got a heated filament and when the wind comes from either you know left to right or right to left, that filament will cool down on one side. Uh, so it measures the wind blowing across the front of our vehicle but not at target end. So that was the only drawback of that. We could have no wind at, the, at our end, but we could have high wind at the other. So you just, you could turn it off, especially in high wind, because you could actually see your sight move. So when uh, First Armour Regiment went to Vietnam, B Squadron in particular, they got involved in uh, a couple of battles known as Bin Bar and Hat Dick. Both of these are villages within the uh, Australian's area of operations. So Hat Dick was one of the battle honours that we have uh, on our standard along with Bin Bar. When we name our tanks, if we had an A squadron tank, it'd start with an A. If we had a B squadron tank, B. So this is a headquarters tank. So this generally belongs to the commanding officer. So we start with a H. Other COs, depending on uh, the era, also had a tank called Hilda. Best Cold War era tank by far, nah. Everybody has their own favourite tanks, but being on this, it's a personal favourite. So if you want to have a ride on our Leopard 1A5, make yourself available for Oz Armour Fest 2024, last weekend in August.